books. They're like YouTube videos you can hold. And while most books are built to be read a small handful of times and then retire to your shelf to make you seem like an intellectual, there's an elite fighting class of books built different. If you've ever gone to the part of the library where everything looks like a Google image search result for book, you've seen it. Yep, these guys. They're library bound built to last hundreds of years according to an exacting 39-page long technical standard, the name of which I'm putting on screen because if I read it out loud, this video would be 45 minutes long. Now, this is not to say that every book in every library is made to outlive you. Lots of them are just off-the-shelf barns and normals that get used up until they fall apart. But there is a good reason for keeping high-use reference books, and frankly as much of the catalog as the library can afford, in this format. Because think about your favorite book. How many times have you or people you lent it to actually sat down and read it? Assuming you didn't pick up a picture book, which I'm now realizing is unlikely, I'd guess that number is in the single digits. Library books, on the other hand, get checked out, flipped through, bent back, photocopied, spilled on, and who knows what's else by unknown numbers of people for as long as they can take it. By one estimate, a commercially bound book could survive about 10 library circulations before it started taking on meaningful damage, which is cool, but the goal for a library book is to handle over a hundred. So libraries have a choice. Watch commercially bound ones deteriorate until it's time to repair or recycle, or invest in ones that can take decades or even centuries of beatings. That's what library binding is for. The standard dates back to 1923 and a group of school librarians who were sick of watching their books fall apart. They established the first standard, and in the century since, it's evolved with changing technologies and priorities. This is the current version, adopted in 2000 the capital S standard, because again, I'm not saying all that. But here's what it means. The standard, as written, is 39 pages long. Page 14 is blank, all these pages are just names, but the rest are an incredibly detailed accounting of what materials to use and how exactly to use them to make a book strong enough to withstand the general public. But we don't just want to tell you about what's in here, we want to show you. That's why I sent my outside correspondent Amy outside to find someone who could show her how to library bind a book. Familiar with the long-standing company policy that bad outside correspondents don't get health insurance, she contacted tons of bookbinders, including a guy named Bookbinder who turned out to be both no help at all and a very, uh, vivid email writer. Luckily, a friendly but camera-shy New York City bookbinder let her visit his shop and its many piles of materials. These things are the backbone pardon me, the spine, of the entire operation. The materials themselves provide a lot of a library bind's strength. That's why there are written rules for everything from the paper, to the cover fabric, to the boards and the covers, to the glue, the foil, and the thread sewing the pages. The glue alone takes up a page and a half. Every material approved in the standard has stood up to rigorous testing, so grade F buckram, probably the strongest option for a book cover, has proven to be resistant to abrasion, breakage, color loss, oil stains, mildew, water, and stank. Papers are beholden to standards of weight, tear, resistance, and bursting strength, whatever that is, and lettering foil has to prove it won't visibly change at all if left in a 158 degree Fahrenheit or 70 degree Celsius dry heat for 10 days. Which is crazy because if you spent 10 days at 158 degrees, not only would you lose some of your shine or whatever, you would die. So if you're looking at a career in being foil lettering on a library book, sorry kid, you don't cut it. Amy's new bookbinder friend inexplicably kept handing her scrap material to take home, which meant she got to give a go to the fun part, binding. There are four acceptable methods of assembling pages together. Sewing through the fold is pretty self-explanatory. The book consists of stacks of paper folded in half. You pop holes through the crease of that fold between a quarter of an inch and one and a half inches apart, then sew through the folded stacks one at a time, attaching each one to the previous one at the end. You can do this by hand or by machine, and if you do it by machine, you need to use, quote, as many needles as possible. Then there's oversewing, which is similar, but instead of going through folded pages, you're going through piles of loose leaf. So you sew mini stacks to themselves and then to each other, and your thread should be covered with glue. You can do this by hand or ask the machine to do it, and we love to show you the thing at work, but when Amy asked the bookbinder about it, he said that machine was, quote, having a bad week. Your next two options are only allowed if you're making a smaller book. For one less than two inches thick, you can do, quote, double fan adhesive binding, where you clamp a stack of pages, notch them, and then load them up with glue in a very specific way. Also, you have to let it air dry because patience is a virtue. If you have an even peewee-er book, less than half an inch thick, you can just sew the whole book through the side in a single pass. There are still rules, of course. You have to use a particular type of stitch, and the stitches have to be half an inch or 13 millimeters long. Amy did, um, her best at sewing through the fold, and it looks, yeah, like she did her best. 
Once your pages are assembled, it's time to trim all the edges so they're smooth and square, glue on the spine, build the front and back covers, attach them to the pages, and stamp in the title, perhaps with one of these. Or if you have gold foil but know that, you can try cheating and hope nobody notices. Each of those processes comes with, of course, extremely specific guidelines down to how you're supposed to fold the cover fabric around the edges. And at the end of it all, voila, book. Way more time and money than a normal book, but this thing is gonna handle just about anything life or the general population throws at it. Now, look, I like books as much as the next guy and sturdily bound ones as much as the guy next to him. But I have to admit that when it comes to learning new things, especially mathy, sciencey things, I can never seem to do it from a book. I could barely even do it in school. For me, the absolute best way to learn that kind of stuff is this video sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant has thousands of lessons, from fundamentals like algebra and Python basics, to the kinds of complex topics I thought I'd never understand, like the large language models that power stuff like ChatGPT or the physics of airplanes. So whether you're trying to pass some math class this semester, or just trying to get a deeper understanding of the world around you, Brilliant offers a super chill, intuitive, interactive way to do it. You can go your own pace with fun little lessons that break everything down into understandable parts and each take 15 minutes or less, making Brilliant the perfect thing for all those weird chunks of day between trains or before your friend shows up or while your canned cinnamon rolls are in the oven or whatever. Goodbye doom scrolling, hello understanding how GPS works. If that sounds good to you, try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days by visiting brilliant.org slash HAI or clicking on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription and you'll be supporting this channel at the same time.